All right. We are trying an experiment here where we're doing a hybrid Grand Rounds where some of us are in person here at Parnassus and some are virtual. So anyway, bear with us with these technical things. Um, anyway, so welcome to everybody, whether you're here or, or online. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Nancy Schoenborn, who has really done fantastic research on how we talk with patients about prognosis and cancer screening in order to promote more individualized care for older adults. And her work is really near and dear to my heart as someone who does a lot of um, work on cancer screening in older people. So I've really um, cited her work multiple times. Um, Dr. Schoenborn received her BA at Stanford and then completed a master's degree and a medical school at Johns Hopkins, as well as completing a residency in internal medicine and a geriatrics fellowship at Johns Hopkins. And that now she's faculty there as an associate professor. I am actually, I still remember uh, being paired with her uh, through the AGS one-on-one -on -one mentoring program uh, where we were paired as a mentor mentee. And I would just remember being so impressed. This is when she was a fellow. Uh, I remember being so impressed with all her really innovative ideas. And she's really turned these really innovative ideas into an amazing research program. So it is just really my pleasure. And I'm so delighted to have her here um, to give UCSF Grand Round. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for that kind introduction. It's really a great honor and as you'll see much of my work has really been inspired by and built on the work of many in this particular audience so it's really a special privilege for me um, to be here with you today. I'll be talking to you today about the role of language in promoting individualized care of older adults. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, my objectives are really to first briefly review why individualized care, especially preventive care, is important in older adults, and to highlight some areas of disconnect between language that we use in clinical practice guidelines and in the scientific literature, and how patients perceive that language, and how that disconnect may hinder uh, individualized care. And then talking about how engaging patients as one strategy to bridge that disconnect, but also discuss some of the complexities and challenges when patient preference may be at odds with evidence. So here, I'm pretty sure I'm preaching to the choir here, you know, on why individualized care is important, um, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'll start with a story about two of my patients from clinic. Um, I have Miss A, who is 65 years old, and so barely meets the age criteria for coming to our geriatric clinic, um, but unfortunately has already accumulated a number of serious illnesses and is limited in her mobility and homebound. So she's dependent on her daughter for a number of instrumental activities of daily living. And for her, her goal is really to focus on quality of life um, and symptom control. In contrast, I also have Ms. B, who is older biological age, uh, 75, but is quite healthy and completely independent. Um, she's still working full time as an architect, and her goal is to continue that work and being able to travel to other states to visit her grandchildren. And so the question is, you know, how should we think about the preventive care for these two patients? Um, thinking about cancer screening decisions, how we approach their blood pressure or blood sugar treatment goals, should they be the same or should we tailor it to each individual? And so thinking about unpacking a little bit why intuitively it may feel like, well, it makes more sense that there's such different patients, maybe their care should also be individualized and to see how that um, is borne out and supported by both evidence and guidelines. Um, and to me, there's really two tenets to why that's important. And so here, citing Dr. Walter's own work, and I've used this slide many times, um, it's the same story of those two patients told on a population level, right? And that is one of the, this is about the heterogeneity of the health status of older adults that we serve. And I think that's really one of the joys of geriatric medicine. Uh, we know that older adults of the same age can have very different health status and therefore very different health trajectories. So what's shown on this figure on the x-axis is um, the biological age of a group of women and their, um, on the y-axis is their life expectancy. And they're grouped um, by the most healthy quartile on that top 
line, the least healthy uh, quartile on the bottom line, and everybody in between. And so if all we know is that a woman is 80 years old, her life expectancy could be as low as uh, five years or as high as over 13 years. And that could make a big difference when we're thinking about preventive care decisions because of the second reason of lack time to benefit. And so here is citing, again, your own Dr. Sealy's work um, that shows, you know, for preventive care, we're really doing something to patients who are asymptomatic now with the goal of providing some benefit in the future. And so here using uh, cancer screening as an example, Dr. Lee's work showed that for breast and colorectal cancer, and the same is true for prostate cancer, the time between that screening and when patients actually receive benefit can lag for 10 or more years. And we know, however, that the burdens and the harms of the intervention usually happens at the time of the intervention. And so putting those two together in this simple schematic, um, for me to how to think about this is that older adults who have different health status going in that top line can have different health trajectories, which means they have different likelihood of experiencing the benefit that's delayed from preventive care. At the same time, the same factors that make them have different health status, so having more health conditions, having functional impairment can also increase the risk of suffering harms and complications, as well as burdens from the intervention in the short term. And so since the benefit and the harms are both affected, it really makes sense that we should individualize care based on the health status and health trajectory of older adults. And indeed, this approach is increasingly recognized and adopted in guidelines. So this is just an example of the different professional societies that have now incorporated using life expectancy as a metric um, to think about whether we should continue um, or stop cancer screening in older adults. Another uh, great example of this in, in diabetes, um, where we know that the benefit of intensive glycemic control is often delayed, while the risks such as hypoglycemia are immediate. And so for that reason, guidelines have increasingly recommended for individualizing how we think about treatment targets of diabetes in older adults. And this is just one example of such a guideline from the American Diabetes Association. And these are the recommended um, factors that we should consider um, when we're individualizing treatment goal. And you see in the middle, there's life expectancy so that for older adults with long life expectancy, we may wanna be more aggressive. Um, and in the older adults with shorter life expectancy to be less stringent in our treatment goal. And so that is really a brief overview as to um, why it's important to individualize preventive care, especially in older adults, um, specifically individualizing around patient's age, health, function, life expectancy, and also patient preferences. And I think this type of work can be um, often categorized under different labels. So I'm thinking about, I'm using the label individualized care, but it could also um, be seen in work around patient-centered care, um, precision medicine, or high value care. Um, I would say individualized care does not always mean uh, less intensive care. In fact, I'll show that there's underuse of certain health services in healthy older adults as well. Um, but I think because, um, at baseline that our culture of healthcare and our system of healthcare is more prone to do than to not do and more prone to do more than to do less. Um, you'll see that much of my work has focused on the de-implementation and de-intensifying um, of care when harms begin to outweigh the benefits. So if those are um, kind of where the evidence and guidelines say we should do, um, how are we actually doing? So uh, as you'll see, there's definitely rooms for improvement. So uh, using cancer screening as an example, there have been uh, multiple national studies 
that show uh, there could be overuse of uh, cancer screening in patients with limited life expectancy. This is one of those studies that looked at four different types of cancer screening in a national sample stratified by their predicted mortality risk or life expectancy, going from the most healthy in the dark bars on the left to the least healthy or the sickest in the uh, close to the white bars on the right. So you see that although cancer screening rates do go down uh, consistently as people are sicker, even in the sickest group, the screening rates are still from 30 to over 50%. On the other hand, there's also national studies showing that in older adults who are uh, healthy and have a long life expectancy, many of them may be underusing cancer screening, um, most likely due to age-specific cutoffs. So it really goes in both directions. Um, going to the diabetes example, we know that nationally there's consistent data showing that many older adults are being treated um, very stringently with an A1C less than seven. And that does not vary by health status, right? So there's really not individualization there. And to achieve that low A1C, many of them are taking high-risk agents. So again, suggesting potential overtreatment. There has been quite a lot of literature on what is contributing to this over or inappropriate use. Um, and the two that I have focused on really has to do with the patient interaction and communication challenges. And so that's what I'll be focusing on today with you as well. And so from some of the earlier work we did with clinicians, we found that clinicians really uh, reported that they were anxious and worried if they were to recommend de-intensifying care, that they would be perceived as giving up um, or judgmental. And it was not something that they felt equipped to do or to discuss. And they felt the conversation around these decisions to be particularly challenging. And so I was really interested to dig into this area a little bit deeper. So what I'll be sharing is some work that kind of um, what I labeled as disconnect, and I'll show you what I mean by that. And so this is a, a qualitative study. We did um, interviewing community dwelling older adults. Um, and we really try to recruit um, people with very different health status. So we have some healthier ones and some with fairly limited life expectancy. And based on the clinician concern, we were really curious to see how um, willing they were to stop cancer screening and how did that recommendation make them think about their providers? Did it actually make them think about them negatively as the clinicians feared? Um, and we found at least in this particular study, they were quite open uh, to the idea of stopping cancer screening um, because um, they trusted their clinicians. And so on the slide are just two quotes um, to demonstrate that. So one participant said, I have all the confidence in my doctor and if she told me to stop it, I would stop. Another participant said, if the doctor says to me, we don't have to do this no more, I say, thank you very much, doc. I probably think more of him. And so that was quite reassuring to us, you know, based on the clinician concern that patients did not actually react negatively. Then we went on to ask them um, about their perspectives on individualizing um, the decision about cancer screening. So, you know, we said to the participants, um, you know, Ms. Smith, how would you feel if we made decisions about cancer screening, not only based on how old you are, but also based on how your health is and how you're functioning from day to day? Everyone was very supportive of that idea. I thought it was great. We actually used scenarios to demonstrate what we meant just to make sure that they understood and we were on the same page. And indeed, they seemed to understand. They, we presented a scenario about a healthy older person, kind of like Miss B, and they thought it made sense to continue to offer screening. And then we presented a, a sick younger person like Miss A, and they said, you know, don't do it. Cancer is not going to be the thing that kill these people if they have all these other issues. So they also seem to be supportive of how to individualize. 
Um, but the disconnect in this study we found was that they did not make the connection um, between all those things and life expectancy. And so um, there has been a growing body of work looking at prediction um, models um, with mortality risk and life expectancy. And Dr. Staley and others' work is one that I use often. Um, and across multiple these prediction models, we know that age and some kind of demographic factor, um, some type of health um, conditions and health status factors, and some kind of functional information are really the main predictors we rely on for predicting life expectancy. And the older adults thought each of those individually were very important uh, to individualize the decision, but they did not equate those to be connected to life expectancy at all. Right? So when we actually showed them uh, verbatim, some of the language from guidelines about how um, we should not continue to screen older adults with limited life expectancy, um, everyone pretty much hated that. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't really understand why, um, you know, did not think that was a good idea. And so this was really a study that showed me there was a disconnect between the paradigm in the guidelines about using life expectancy as a metric and how patients perceive that not to be necessarily relevant. A second study I'll share with you um, was around diabetes. As you may recall, this was an earlier figure that showed these are the parameters uh, recommended by the American Diabetes Association as to um, what we should consider when we individualize treatment goal. And also there's a directionality as to how we should use each of these parameters to individualize. And so in a national study, um, survey of 818 older adults um, with type 2 diabetes, we asked um, about each of those parameters and um, in relation to their treatment um, regimen. So we presented a um, one scenario was that if their A1C is 8, um, is any of these uh, parameters a good reason to add a medicine? Um, versus if their A1C is less than seven, is any of this a good reason to stop a medicine? So for example, um, we asked if uh, having long life expectancy is a good reason to add a medicine um, when their A1C is eight, and whether short life expectancy is a good reason to stop a medicine when the A1C is less than seven. So we found that for each of the factors, um, they thought it was more relevant for adding medicine and less so for stopping medicines. In fact, almost half uh, thought none of these uh, factors were relevant uh, for deciding whether they should stop a medicine for diabetes. And so here, there was really a disconnect on um, the relevance of these factors that are in the guidelines to individualize, um, and especially in deprescribing, there seemed to be a gap as to how patients perceive their relevance. In the same study, we also was curious about the directionality of the effect. So for each of those parameters, we gave them examples of a person with a uh, life expectancy of five years versus 15 years. And we said, who do you think should be treated more aggressively? And we did that for each of the um, parameters. And we found that for three of the five factors, the perception was that it should actually have an opposite effect than what the guideline recommended. So they thought that someone who had already more severe diabetes complications, for example, should be treated more aggressively, um, whereas the guideline recommend the opposite. So again, there was a disconnect between patient perceptions um, and their intuitive reaction and what the guideline recommendations are. Um, the last study I, I wanna share with you in this, in this section is not my own work, but I just find it so fascinating. So this was about, lung cancer screening um, with veterans. And um, there's actually a published taxonomy of the harms of lung cancer screening. And so the study team, um, as you'll see on the bottom, in the blue on the left, that's the benefit of lung cancer screening, which is reduced death. And then routine screening is really kind of neutral, something we do. And then the red um, are, are the a number of 
harms or what we would consider harms of lung cancer screening. So significant incidental findings, um, having to go to nodule clinic, have to get lung biopsies to figure out if the nodules are actually cancerous, over diagnosis, over treatment, false positives and radiation. So they asked the participants they provide a description of each of the outcomes and ask the participants to then sort them as a benefit or a harm. And they perceive the benefits as benefits, but they also perceived a lot of the harms actually as benefits. Um, so they thought having to undergo a lung biopsy, for example, to figure out if it's cancer was not necessarily a negative thing because it gave them more information and helped them find out if they had cancer or not. And so the paper's title was actually, When is Harm a Harm? Right? Can you imagine that we're talking about benefit and harms in shared decision making, which is actually required for lung cancer screening? Um, and the things that we consider as harms are not perceived as harms of patients. Um, and so this type of disconnect, I think some lessons I drew was that one, de-intensifying care um, seems not to be a familiar or intuitive concept to patients. And some may argue may be true for clinicians as well. And then specific terms like life expectancy or even more commonly used terms like benefits and harms, sometimes they mean different things to patients. And so you can imagine that can lead to communication challenges as well as mismatch in understanding and priority. And I think it can lead to both over and under treatment. Not only do words matter uh, in the sense that if we don't see eye to eye and we're not on the same page with patients, it can lead to confusion and misunderstanding. But also I wanna show you some work that shows um, words we use sometimes maybe interchangeably can have different effects and maybe unintended um, effects on patients and just the power of that. And so this um, is a study looking at the power of labels. Uh, so it was a survey of healthy adults and they presented the hypothetical scenario of an incidental thyroid lesion. And they systematically varied the scenario where the risk of disease progression varied from zero to 5%, um, whether the treatment would be surveillance or involve surgery. And they changed the label of that lesion to be cancer, tumor, or nodule. And, and they combined them in a systematic way and asked um, which scenario the participants preferred. And they found that people were willing to accept surgery over surveillance, and they're willing to accept a 5% over a 1% chance of disease progression if it meant the disease was labeled a nodule instead of a cancer. So, you know, I know that I probably wouldn't necessarily use cancer and nodule interchangeably, but, you know, sometimes I do see the cancer word show up in radiology reports, and perhaps some could use tumor and nodule interchangeably. So I think just being thoughtful and aware of how powerful the words choices we use um, on patients can be, can be really important. This is similar reasoning, but looking at um, women without a breast cancer and presented um, a diagnosis of ductal um, carcinoma in situ, which is quite controversial as whether it's cancer or not. And I think here it's probably more common that it can be labeled as cancer. Um, and they described this as cancer lesion or an abnormal cells. And again, that label significantly impacted how often um, the woman chose surgery um, versus not. So um, there was a recent um, opinion piece in JAMA that actually, these are definitely terms I use interchangeably that actually argue that when we say risks versus benefits, we really should be saying harms versus benefits because that risk may emphasize the uncertainty related to harms, but we don't have the same equivalent in benefits and, and that may actually bias one towards intervention. And then this was a study I really, um, really loved reading. So this is a study that looked at language and diabetes and cardiovascular guidelines. And they, they classified them as uh, recommendations to do more of something, which they call de-intensification recommendations, um, or to do less of something. And so not too surprisingly, they found that, you know, 
if they just counted the recommendations, most of them were about intensification. And this did not vary by the strength of evidence. So it's not because that there's just less evidence to support the intensification because for the weak recommendations based on little evidence, there are still more recommendations to intensify. But I was fascinated by the language. So the intensification recommendations are very clear and unqualified. So people with diabetes and hypertension should be treated to a systolic blood pressure goal of less than 140 millimeters mercury. Okay, contrast that with the recommendation to de-intensify. Glycemic goals in some older adults might reasonably be relaxed using individual criteria, but hyperglycemia should still be avoided. Right? So I ask you, reading such a guideline, how can a clinician actually realistically implement that? Right? So I think there is a very different contrast in the guideline language that may bias us towards more using and intensified uh, treatment over the other one. Um, so again, I think all of these are studies that really taught me the importance of language and the importance of words. So what are the right words if they're so important? Um, so one strategy might be to ask the patients. And so this was um, from that same qualitative study on cancer screening I shared earlier. We actually asked them different uh, phrases um, to refer to reasons to not do cancer screening. Um, and we specifically said, you know, because this test will not help you live longer, or you may not live long enough to benefit from the test. And we found that people really did not like the second one. Um, they thought it was very harsh. And there was a, a clear preference um, over one phrasing to the next. Um, and so we followed that with a national study of 881 older adults. And we tested if the premise is that your doctor um, doesn't think you need another mammogram or colonoscopy or a PSA test. What's the best way to explain that to you? Is it because guidelines say we don't, uh, we shouldn't? Is it because of your age? And we tested those two uh, references to life expectancy. Is it more around the screening test itself that it's inconvenient or uncomfortable, or maybe we shouldn't bring it up? So this comes up a lot from clinicians. They say, well, I don't have time to talk about things I'm not gonna do. So if I'm not gonna do something, I will just not mention it. Um, and so we asked them which one they preferred. And so this is um, on the, on the blue bars are the times that they preferred an explanation and the orange is when they did not prefer it. And so you see, it's not, it's not hundred percent. There's, you know, not one phrase that worked for everyone or was hated by everyone, but there was a clear trend. We found that um, talking about a shift in priorities was the uh, one that was the most preferred. And that really came out in the qualitative work as well, where patients really felt like if you're not going to do a mammogram, what are you going to do? Um, so that they did not feel like they were receiving less care. And so this was really helpful to um, hopefully clinicians to guide. These are the conversations that they mentioned, the clinicians mentioned to be challenging. And hopefully patients' inputs can help guide them towards some of the phrases um, framing that might work better. Uh, in another study, we asked the same question about the prescribing, which again can be uncomfortable um, conversation for clinicians. And um, I'm excited to present work that um, Helen here is in the audience and was part of as well. And so this was again a national survey where we asked um, what um, might be different ways to discuss de-prescribing a statin. Um, and we found that uh, talking about the risk of adverse effects really resonated the most with the participants. Um, whereas on the bottom, talking about how that may be a burdensome or extra effort um, did not um, uh, resonate with them so much. And we asked uh, in a separate scenario about deprescribing a sedative um, that helped them with sleep. And again, we saw that um, the increased risk of adverse effects resonated the most. And surprisingly, talking about how 
it won't help them function did not resonate uh, talking about becoming dependent was not also all that um, preferred as well. And so again, I think it's um, interesting to hear from the patient's perspective, their priorities and how um, different explanations might um, match, uh, resonate with them the most um, and help them align the priorities the best. So um, if I just end it there, I think that would be a pretty neat uh, package, right? So we identified a gap. Um, there's a disconnect. We're not doing so well. And then we found a solution, um, engaging patients. And so that, um, but I also wanted to share that sometimes research is not always clear cut and neat, um, especially for the trainees. And that doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that it has to be intimidating. Um, so there's also complexities and, and messy, um, but I think um, that could be an opportunity to dig deeper and more thoughtfully. And so some of what I will share in the next section, I don't have uh, the right answers. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts um, during the discussion. And so, uh, what if the patient preference is not uh, aligned with what the evidence suggests that we should do? And so one of the recent works we're working on is really to think about messaging and how to message in a way to reduce overscreening for breast cancer in older women. So we know that for decades, um, public health has talked about how mammogram saves lives, cancer screening saves lives. There has been no messaging um, that cancer screening could have harms, or that for some people at some point in their lives, it might be appropriate to stop screening, that maybe we don't have to screen everyone until they die. Um, so there really isn't any counter messaging. So we're thinking about ways to um, provide a more balanced information so people can make more informed decisions. And so during pilot testing with older women to get feedback about the specific wording of messages, we found that um, Rest, kind of similar to that lung cancer screening study, when we described what we would consider harms of screening, like false pauses, overdiagnosis, they did not really want to describe those as harms. They thought that was too harsh. They thought it was too negative. Um, and when we ended the message with something like, you know, in women for whom the harms of screening outweigh the benefits, um, they should stop screening. They thought that was too definitive, you know, so they wanted to say something like, it may be worthwhile to consider stop screening, right? And so in that background context of literature repeatedly showing that patients overestimate the benefits and underestimate the harms of cancer screening, what is the right thing? Is it more important to disregard what they said and just put it out there if it sounds harsh to make sure they understand that these are harms, or is it more important to respect to their preference and maybe that'll make them more accepted? Um, so I don't know, I don't know the right answer. But that really led me to think more deeply about this idea of informing versus persuading. So here is um, just from Google an, an example of a, a page from a decision aid. So the content is what um, not what I want you to focus on, but this is a vaccine um, decision aid. What you see that there's basically what happens if you don't get vaccinated on the left and what happens if you get vaccinated on the right. It's a very balanced information. In fact, for the international standards of developing patient decision aids, having balanced information is one of the key criteria. In contrast to what I'm going to show you on the next slide, and I'm going to warn you in advance that it can be very um, vocally alarming. It's from an anti-smoking ad. Um, and so here you see, um, in contrast, very powerful imagery um, and language that's really intended, I think, to evoke fear, guilt, um, aversion, right? And, and the information about why you shouldn't smoke are pretty tiny um, and you can't really read it. So, um, so that's really a, a contrast here. The, the goal is really to persuade and, and less so to inform. And so is it ethical um, to persuade patients towards a specific decision? 
um, when I looked into the literature, there really isn't a clear consensus, right? We're trying to balance. I know we have bioethicists in the audience, so I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. We're trying to really balance um, patient autonomy. So does persuasion, um, is it manipulative? Um, is it threatening patient autonomy? But on the other hand, we're also obligated to promote benefit and minimize harms. And so some of the consensus in the literature seems to think it's generally acceptable to remove existing bias or misinformation and to provide recommendations based on reason. It's less clear if it's acceptable to appeal to emotions um, if it's okay to use anecdotes, which by definition is not generalizable or representative. Um, is it okay to use framing in an unbalanced way when we know that framing can impact their decision making? And I think this is really um, relevant in the day to day. So, you know, I think about the words I use when I talk about cancer screening. So I say, okay, we should focus on your health priorities. Do I say, I don't think you need another mammogram, which is giving them permission? Or I say more strongly, I don't think you should get another mammogram, or I really don't think you should get another mammogram, right? I'm still making a recommendation here. You could argue all of them based on reason and evidence, um, but they're a little bit different. So how pushy is too pushy? What if I started talking about other examples? Do you really want to live through anxiety and pain of biopsy? You know, I had a patient who had pain for months, which is true, right? What if I become more personal and talk about family members? Now, I had a grandmother who had a, a small breast cancer. She had to get surgery. And then, you know, she died from a heart disease. And as she was dying, she thought about all that worry, the surgery, doctor's appointments. You know, she really regretted that. And I would really hate for you to feel like that one day. You know, I mean, so we're kind of getting closer, closer to that gray area. And I don't know if that's acceptable, but I can imagine if you think about the stories that are in the media about cancer screening that are pro screening, it's often um, kind of a tearjerker story, like a young, young, young mother um, with young children and she had a mammogram and saved her life. And how wonderful is that, right? So this is really kind of a counter example, but is this, sometimes it feels uncomfortable. So I mean, that's kind of one direction I've been wrestling with. Um, but not to leave you in the messiness um, that may feel daunting. I think um, I want to just briefly share some of the lessons I've learned along the way that remind me to stay humble um, and curious. And I think there's always, um, you know, maybe I don't know uh, as much I think as I think I do, and there's always room to learn more. Um, so one uh, was the lesson. This is actually a quote from a clinician doing an interview. Um, that talks about the value of reassurance from cancer screening. And so, you know, he said, it's easy to dismiss those things when you look at them in an abstract standpoint, maybe like me, who's a researcher. He didn't say that. Um, but if you're really anxious about breast cancer and you really want that reassurance of the mammogram, it can be an awful lot. And it really made me think, you know, we're not measuring the value of reassurance. When we think about the benefit of screening, we're really thinking about reducing cancer specific mortality. And so how do we um, really factor in these maybe less tangible and unmeasured um, benefits and harms? You could argue we're also not measuring psychological distress from false positives and biopsies as well. Um, you know, but was I too cavalier sometimes to discount its importance, right? Thinking, oh, doctors and patients, they just want to get screened so much. We need to just, you know, reduce all this unnecessary task. You know, does it have its value for some patients? And how do we individualize that? The second lesson I learned was that not doing something may be harder than I thought. This was a, a great study that looked at people who self-identified as being overdiagnosed with thyroid cancer. So they had an incidental finding, and these patients chose against intervention because of the information they were provided that it's unlikely to progress. And I really asked about their experience. So 12 to 18 um, were told by their acquaintances that they were stupid. Um, that they were wrong or crazy, so much that um, 15 resorted to keeping this as a secret, and they all wish for more support. 
So it made me think about, you know, maybe I think, oh, just don't get a test. How hard is that? You know, are they getting pressured? Does that affect how they think about themselves? Is it really a bigger deal than I thought to stop insulin? And how can I do better to support them after, before and after they decide to stop something or de-intensify something? And so I think in summary, um, we've really talked about the importance of individualized care and how there are disconnects between the language we use scientifically and how patient perception and that disconnect can contribute to a lot of the barriers to individualized care um, and the importance of the words and language we use. And so in part, we can address that by eliciting patient preference um, but I think there's still a lot more work to be done in how to walk that line between informing and guiding versus persuading. Because as we saw in the pandemic, only providing facts does, does it, has its own downsides as well, right? To that it could allow misinformation and misperception to, to prevail. Um, so what is the right balance? But I think even when it's messy and we don't know all the right answers, uh, we can always keep learning from our patients and colleagues with humility and curiosity. And I think with those two elements, um, we can hopefully find a way to move forward from all this. So I want to um, thank all of the funders that supported this work um, and all my mentors, collaborators, as well as mentees, uh, especially Dr. Walter's work that really inspired this whole journey, as well as the ePrognosis team that um, really helps me think through some of this. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your comments. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. So I have a couple of questions and I'll turn it over to folks here in the room. So I was thinking about the, you know, that some some decisions are very preference sensitive where, you know, the, the benefits and the harms are not that different, right? There's some decisions though where the benefits clearly outweigh the harms or, or some where the harms are clearly outweigh the benefits. Is there a time where would that affect the strength of the recommendation? Because you talked about how persuasive should we be. Is there anything around like, you know, when something is just so much more likely to be harmful or so much more likely to be um, um, helpful versus the one that's kind of that toss up? Or you don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely an important consideration that should be factored. And I, I think there's so much complexity. So on the one hand, I think when you talk to the decision making folks, they really say the decision aid is only for um, when there's medical equipoise, right? When we don't know what the right thing to do, that's when shared decision making is the most relevant. I would say nowadays, I think it's it's being recommended for things that maybe the benefits and harms are not completely equal. And I think it makes it harder because it seems like such a, a safe and always good solution to do shared decision-making. Um, but we don't always know exactly what that looks like when the benefit and harms are not equal. Um, I don't think we're ever gonna find examples like the smoking where there's absolutely no benefit health-wise and complete harm, right? We're never gonna have clear cuts like that. So how do we approach it? On the other hand, you know, Terry Freed also wrote the opinion piece that's really pointing that we only shove the difficult decisions to patients for shared decision making and we save the easy ones we don't give them participation in that decision and so i think i can see both sides and i think it's i think it definitely should be factored but how to factor it i don't know that we know exactly so more study questions for people who are interested in this area terrific anyone here have any questions I'll take the prerogative to answer or ask another question because I'm very interested in how people um, respond that health, like talking about health priorities, that's not as scary as talking about life expectancy. Sort of tell me a little bit about what you found around that. Because again, I when I talk about stopping cancer screening, I, all, I will often say it's we need to prioritize all these other things that you that are currently causing you to have a problem. Um, and that seems to be well received um, versus, yeah, telling somebody, oh, you're not going to live long enough. I've I've never done that approach. But anyway, it's just interesting that there's a disconnect between health 
and and life expectancy. Yeah, no, there really is. I don't think I think life expectancy is very scary for a lot of people. So talking about, you know, I think we have a lot of going on already with your heart failure and with your, you know, dialysis. And I really think we should prioritize taking care of those issues. And I don't think we need to focus on mammogram at this time. And I don't think we need another one. Um, but I think it's important to always tie that overall health goals, because I know there's a lot of work, um, you know, by Mary Tanetti and others to talk about goal directed care. I think it's important to still come back to the concrete, right? So if they say, well, my goal is to quality of life and not have pain, or my goal is to work as long as possible and to visit grandchildren. What does that mean for the decision at hand? And patients with coaching perhaps, but without coaching, they may not always make that connection easily for clinicians to just take it on a plate, right? So sometimes we may have to say, given those are your goals, I think this is the most aligned choice. Do you think that's true or not true? And I feel like often I have to guide them a little bit into translating that goal into what the decision might look like. I see, trying to see if there's, yeah. There's another one, I don't know. Here's the second one. Hi, that was a great talk. Um, I'm just wondering if you've seen shifts occurring over, you know, the past 10 years that you've been, or 10 plus years that you've been involved in this research in terms of people, societies, patients across the board's interest in this area. And especially in terms of clinicians, I just feel like um, there's, there's not really a lot of incentive for clinicians to really dial back what they're doing because it both reduces profits and is also difficult to have these conversations. Um, but I feel like there's kind of a shift going, there's starting to be a shift going on as value-based care becomes more important. Um, and so, yeah, I just I was just curious about your sense yeah, of, no, of that's how that's a great that's question. I, I think there is um, a shift towards high value care. Um, I think how to define high value in each case is not consistent yet. And I think it could be variable. And so high value care for a healthy middle age or even healthy older adult could be to do more care. So I don't think we are there yet to individualize or have the quality metrics be um, flexible enough to reflect the individualization. So there is a shift towards more patient-reported outcomes as one way to get at how to how to measure high value in that way. Um, I would say the the lack of resonance around life expectancy has not changed much from what I can tell. Um, I think clinicians are motivated to do the right thing. Um, I think that's the type of people who come to medicine. And so some have thought perhaps by removing the barriers that incentivize them to do the opposite, they might be free to do um, what they would have done. There's also um, some interesting work from behavior economics that look at setting defaults um, 
and nudges to to make it easier. Um, you know, the the default is to you know maybe they could individualize the the default and the reminders that come up or or not come up. And so those are some some of the exciting areas that's still growing. Yeah. So the question I have is actually related to what. Um, Lauren's question and also um, the thing that you said at the end, which is around like EMRs and Epic and that sort of thing and how they can have like reminders that pop up. But even more beyond that are like metrics that physicians might be tied to that are related to like either bonuses or like, you know, quality metrics that they're evaluated by. And I'm just curious, like whether or not um, this um, excellent research um, has been sort of um, brought to health systems um, and and also like the financial incentives that are tied to all of that. Um, and in particular, the way that population health might not reflect like individual needs, like people who are more healthy or less healthy. Yeah, that's been an area of learning growth myself. Uh, personally, I, I know Say is in the audience and we're both on the quality and performance measure committee, AGS, and learning more about measure. I feel like it's really a cycle. So you talk to the, the people at CMS, they say, you know, well, we want the evidence, but there's not enough evidence to help us make the guidelines. And then the people say, well, we have to, you know, once CMS have their rules, then that's kind of what the quality metrics have to be aligned by. And then it affects the, the clinicians. And who needs to change first? You know, it's kind of a little bit like a chicken and egg question, in my opinion. But you're right, there is um, still a lot of, I think, on a population health level, they're kind of grouped together um, to, to be able to distinguish and also to think about the unintended consequences. I think it's a really tricky area because there's research that shows doctors that do more appropriate screening also do more overuse. And there's a lot of concern that reducing overuse might also reduce appropriate screening. And so um, I don't think that's an area we have studied yeah but yeah there is still a lot of inconsistencies um, between the metrics we have and and docs and i think emr could be you know a force for good or a force for 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 evil depending on how how we use it um, we found that in a study the reminders are are very much connected so we found that first doctors sometimes said they just did things or didn't do things um, out of, not because of a rational weighing of benefits and harms. I was like, oh my gosh, what, what about all this decision-making science that we've been focusing on? They said, well, I just did it because there was a reminder and I didn't do it because there wasn't a reminder. Now I think about it, maybe I shouldn't have done it in the first person and I should have done it in the second person, right? And so could there be ways to, incorporate some of this individualization um, in the EMR to support them so there's less work and burden on the docs. I think that's one of the, the thought to move forward. Great, and I have some questions from the online folks. Yes, please. Um, so Ashwin Cotwell asks, how do you consider conversations over time? Can you prepare people that at some point we may want to discuss whether to continue mammograms or stop or ask at what point would you want to stop mammograms? So sort of giving people you know, time to think about it. I think that's a great point. And I think, um, I think uh, Alex's work and others have looked at that planting the seed in prognosis conversation. So I think the same is likely true, but I don't think it has been formally studied. So I can only see anecdotally in my clinical practice, I often do, right? So if I say, I don't think you need another one, they say, oh, I don't know, I still would feel better. So then I say, okay, how about we'll get it every two years at least, so we don't have to need it every year. You know, how about one more the next time we can think about we don't need it again if this one's normal, right? So I think it does make sense in that process of um, negotiation. But I think ideally, if when we start mammograms at 40 or 50, we set the expectation, just so you know, this is going to end at some point when the harms always the benefits, that would be kind of, you know, the, 
the best approach, but I think we're still a little ways from, from implementing that. But I think that would be ideal to kind of when we start the medicine to say, this is a trial. If you don't find any benefit, we're going to stop after, you know, three months, right? And so it's much easier at three months to say, remember, we said we're not going to continue this if you can't tell me how it's helping you, right? I'm thinking of like dementia um, medicines. So if we can do that with these type of preventive care, I think that would be really helpful. Agree. And then say Lee asks, uh, it's a question around reassurance. It's how much reassurance is appropriate after a negative mammogram. It, my last reading of the data was that a negative mammogram only decreased a woman's risk of breast cancer by a tiny amount. So is this reassurance really alter the, you know, after, does it really, should it really change after a negative mammogram? So to that idea that you can't underestimate that as a benefit, but if it's really not that much of a benefit. Yeah, no, you're right. And we can kind of dig into it, you know, well, if they think it's reassuring, you know, how, how, how do we judge whether their perceived reassurance is appropriate and supported by evidence? That I have no idea. I don't think that's been studied. Um, and it could be very true. I mean, a, a long the, the lines that we know, they overestimate benefits. So it's entirely possible they over um, attribute reassurance um, that's not warranted by the data. So I think it is a mixed picture though, that you know we tend to think if they are informed, they will make decisions aligned by the evidence that they're being informed by. And I think there is a trend, um, but it's hard to know how much, it's not, it's not everybody. Um, and, and how do you gauge how informed they are? I think in the clinical setting is the, is the tricky question for me. And so how do you know that they're actually overcalling it? Um, and, and if they persist in that, how strongly should I challenge it, I think are the challenges I have. But that's really interesting. And I have to keep thinking about that. Absolutely. Gets to sort of trying to study the art of medicine and how we talk to people about these things, which again, you're doing does a great job. The last, um, the last question here in the, in the chat is from Jana Schwartz. And she says, can you talk about differences in words and approaches in different cultures? Oh my gosh. I love that question. Thank you. Um, and I was saying different languages, right? So I have not ventured there and I think it's ripe for study, right? Um, you know, sometimes, um, I'm asked, you know, have I have I translated or recruited people, you know, in different different languages? And I was like, I don't even know how we're gonna say this in English yet. So so not yet, right? And so I think that adds so much complexity, and I think that's really important to to study because um, I know having come from a different cultural background, being Chinese. Um, you know, sometimes I go to doctor's appointments with my parents and we heard the same thing. They understand English and then they they have a very different interpretation. Right. And um, and for them, I really have to be very straightforward and say, no, dad, what she meant is that you really need to take the metformin <laughs> for your diabetes. And, and so I think that's um, a great and really important area to kind of extend this, this research um, so that we can understand how it's application in different cultures and languages. Terrific. Well, I think that's a great place to end. And thank you so much for just a really thought-provoking and great talk. So thank you thank so much. Thank you, everyone. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody who's online. Okay.